guess we'll get started. Uh, we have a few different presentations today from our talented medical students that are rotating with us. Uh, uh, Nico Ronquillo is going to start um, talking about some research that he's done. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nico Ronquillo, and I'm a fourth year medical student here at the U. And today I'll talk about my uh, PhD work under uh, Wolfgang Baer here at the Moran Ice Center. And the topic of my talk is uh, a new animal model for a uh, human syndrome called Senior Loken Syndrome. So Senior Loken Syndrome is a syndrome which causes both retinitis pigmentosa and medullary cystic kidney disease uh, in patients. The medullary cystic kidney disease is also called nephronophthesis. This was first described in 1961 and is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner. This is an ultra rare disease affecting one in one million people worldwide. With these estimates, we would predict that there's around two or three uh, individuals here in Utah that have this disease. And we have identified three families with senior Logan syndrome here in Utah. The classic findings, um, as most of you know, of retinitis pigmentosa um, is a photoreceptor degeneration. Um, Patients with senior Loken syndrome can have clinical symptoms of RP, including night blindness, uh, first appearing as early as eight years old. This is one of our patients with senior Loken syndrome, and here I'm showing just the hallmarks of RP, including uh, uh, bone, the bone spicules around the periphery of the retina. Now, similarly, nephronophthesis, the other component of the syndrome, also presents early, and the median age to end-stage kidney disease is 13 years old. There's three hallmarks for nephronophthesis that I'd like you to know. Uh, the first is uh, that these kidneys are small in, in, in patients. Second is the presence of cortical medullary cysts. And the third is the presence of fi uh, interstitial fibrosis. And here are just pictures showing the cysts in a, a grossly in a ultrasound and through histology. So the question is what causes senior Loken syndrome? So far, there have been seven genes when mutated are associated with development of this disease named, NP, uh, named NPHP1, 4, 5, and so on. NPHP stands for nephronophthesis or nephrocysteine genes. And the pictures on the right just correspond to the proteins that they encode. And I just wanted to emphasize that there's, uh, there's no similarities with how the proteins look like or their, uh, or their uh, uh, function. But out of these seven genes, NPHP5 are the most frequent cause of senior Loken syndrome. And shown in this um, pie graph, up to, uh, close to 50% of all known uh, mutations of senior Loken syndrome, NPHP5 is, uh, have mutations. And it's also called, NPHP5 is also called IQCB1. However, I wanted to point out that over 60% of senior Loken syndrome cases in the world these, we still don't, do not know the causative mutations for these genes. And this includes the three families that, that we are studying here in, in Utah. We do not know the mutations causing the disease. So I proposed to study NPHP5 because I thought that this was an important protein to study for understanding retinal disease specific to um, senior Loken syndrome. I knew it was going to be important because when I looked at all the patients in the world with senior Loken syndrome, with NPHP5 mutations, I saw that there was 100% penetrance when you have mutations in NPHP5 uh, progressing to uh, retinal degeneration and senior Loken syndrome. So it was, uh, it, um, I, I was very surprised at that. And on more practical reasons, there was no good animal model for this disease. There was no mouse model uh, mimicking the human disease. And also, what was known, when I, uh, very little was known about, about NPHP5. The only things that were known on NPHP5 when I started this project was first that the mutations in the human disease caused a non-functional protein, meaning the protein's gone, it's, it, it, it just doesn't work. Second, we know that the NPHP5 was in the photoreceptors. Um, uh, with specifically, it was localized in mouse and human photoreceptor connecting cilium transition zone, or transition zone, um, an outer segment. This is just an immunocytochemistry from uh, one study. Uh, the ONL or the photoreceptor cell layer here in blue, and this is just a blow up, um, is, is in here. And um, 
the outer segment of photoreceptors is labeled green here by NPHP5, suggesting that NPHP5 localize in the outer segments. Now, uh, EM studies or electron mic uh, micrographs show that these little uh, dots in here correspond to NPHP5, suggesting that NPHP5 is located in the connecting cilium, which is a bridge uh, from the inner segment uh, of the photoreceptors uh, to the outer segment uh, of photoreceptors. And protein trafficking goes from inner segment to the outer segment of cells. So in humans, we know that loss of function mutations in NPHP5 cause a disease. And to model this, we made a global knockout of NPHP5. And just briefly, we basically uh, inserted a gene trap early in the gene so that we have early termination um, of uh, protein translation, having a non-functional protein. So we confirmed absence of the NPHP5 wild type allele in the knockout mice through PCR. And we also, um, uh, um, confirmed absence of the NPHP5 protein through Western blot shown here in kidney lysates. In photoreceptor cells, we also showed at an early time point that the knockout mouse do not express NPHP5. The blue here is just the photoreceptor cell bodies, the outer nuclear layer, and the red is the NPHP5 here in a control animal. The green is just a marker for the connecting cilium called Centrin 2, and it's labeled here as green. In the knockout animals, as we can see, the structure early on is a pretty normal, except that NPHP5, we, we just can't see red, confirming that we do have uh, knockout animals. So with, with this, the animal is viable. Uh, the first question we ask is whether the absence of NPHP5, like in humans, sufficient to cause retinal degeneration in the mouse. <coughs> And the answer is yes. So these are, the, uh, these are control retinas at different time points at postnatal day 6, 10, and 14. And here I'm just showing again the outer nuclear layer at different time points. And we label the outer segments uh, here in red with rhodopsin. And as we can see, as the retina develops, we see increased rhodopsin or uh, the outer segments um, uh, maturing. In the knockout animals, what I'd like you to focus on at, uh, in this figure is just the thickness of the outer nuclear layer. In early animals, before eye opening, uh, we see that the outer nuclear layer is pretty normal. But once the mouse uh, opens it, its eyes around P12, so this is postnatal day 14, we see significant degeneration. And these results become even more significant as time lapses, especially at one month of age. And this is a depiction of the fundus photos at one month of age. So these are control animals, both wild type and heterozygote fundus photos. And this is an OCT. And these are normal. But in the knockout animals, we see a, a hyperfluorescent signal here suggesting panretinal thinning. And this is confirmed by OCT as well. So this is at one month of age. And when you look histologically, there is maybe one cell layer left in the, in the uh, photoreceptor cell bodies. So uh, what I've shown you is structurally there is retinal degeneration, but how about functionally? Do we see any functional deficits? And the answer is yes. First, there's absent scotopic ERG response in the knockout animals. These are just representative traces of ERGs from the, from the wild type and heterozygote animals at different light intensities. And in the knockout animals, we see a complete absence of the rod response at one month of age. We actually never see a rod response even at the very earliest time point that I've done it at P14. Um, suggesting that uh, functionally the rods are not working. The cones also at one month of age show the same results. <coughs> and they have absent photopic ERG responses uh, shown here by our, uh, my representative traces. So we see just a flat line uh, at one month of age. So what I've shown you so far is that the loss of NPHP5 um, in the mouse causes retinal degeneration similar to the human disease. But how about the kidneys? And so just briefly, I, I just want to remem uh, remind you that nephronephthesis has three hallmarks, small kidneys, presence of corticomedullary cysts, and the presence of interstitial fibrosis. And the first thing that I've shown is that the knockout animals do are smaller and, have, and um, uh, exhibit degeneration. So I've labeled. Uh, uh, cells undergoing apoptosis or cell death through tunnel staining, so the green stain, and in the knockout animals, we see um, significant increase of cell death uh, in, in the kidney. So these are just cross sections of, of a kidney. The second hallmark was presence of cysts, and this is just one example of uh, just the cysts that form in these mouse, and this is uh, most likely a ruptured cyst in the knockout mouse. 
And then finally, the third hallmark is uh, fibrosis. So we looked at the animals, and at uh, one month of age, we do see significant um, uh, uh, staining with a, a trichrome stain, which uh, stains for collagen fibers. Uh, in the knockout animals. And uh, this is minimal fibrosis, uh, but if you quantify it, it is significant compared to wild type. What I will tell you though, uh, is that there seems to be an intermediary phenotype in the, in the uh, heterozygote animals. <coughs> so at this point, we think that we have a good model for senior locan syndrome. So we wanted to explore further uh, the mechanism of NPHP5. And our initial hypothesis uh, was that NPHP5 was important in connecting cilia formation, uh, which is that uh, little uh, zone, that little bridge that connects the inner segment to the outer segment of photoreceptors. <coughs> and first, so to, to be able to see this, we've done uh, EM studies. And uh, these are wild type and um, uh, heterozygote animals at a very early time point at P10. And here what I'm showing with the arrows is a normal connecting cilium. So this is the basal body, this is the connecting cilium, these are outer segment of photoreceptor cells. In the heterozygote animals, it seems to be normal as well. <coughs> but in knockout animals, we s the, first, the first finding is that we never see an outer segment. We never see these uh, uh, st stacks of discs forming. And uh, the connecting cilium, it's very difficult to say, but it seems that it's abnormal as well, having a smaller lumen um, uh, compared to both the wild type and the knockout animal. Now, this is a static picture. We, we still do not understand really the function of NPHP5, but we think it's important for protein trafficking, um, uh, uh, connecting, you know, trafficking protein synthesized um, in the inner segments up to the outer segments. And several, we have several evidence for this hypothesis. Uh, including uh, mislocalization of, of, uh, of rhodopsin very early on. I've shown this figure before, but now I'd like to highlight that, you know, at early time points of P6, we see that rhodopsin already traffics normally to the outer segments of these cells. But early, uh, you know, with uh, the knockout animals, we see rhodopsin mislocalizing, and it's more, it's, uh, more significant here at P10, we see that uh, it's in around the perinuclear region of these cells, suggesting that uh, rhodopsin, and we've stained for other proteins, are having a difficult time trafficking to the outer segment of cells. Now, it doesn't seem to be a global phenomenon, meaning it may not be causing all proteins to mislocalize. There seems to be a specificity for this, because uh, um, in cone cells, and this, this may be important clinically as well, so in cone cells, so this is a control animal, and we've labeled um, the uh, cone uh, opsin with S opsin, here shown in red now, um, we, uh, we see that these are the cone outer segments. In the knockout animals, we still see that uh, at, an, uh, at, uh, uh, at a stage where we don't see rhodopsin anymore in the outer segments, in the cone cells, we still see evidence of uh, normal trafficking of, cone, of uh, cone pigments. So this, we can infer from this that the human disease, or uh, in the mouse model, and maybe extend to the human disease, that this is, that the cell um, target of NPHP5 mutations are rod cells. And uh, cone cells may be preserved and uh, degenerate early on once all the rod cells uh, have died already. And this may be uh, very important for uh, designing strategies for therapeutics. <coughs> so just as a summary of what I've told you, the NPHP5 knockout mouse uh, recapitulate the pathologic hallmarks of senior locan syndrome, including the progressive retinal degeneration and cystic kidney disease. Second, we think that NPHP5 is important for completion of ciliogenesis or outer segment formation. I haven't shown you some of our in vitro data that um, suggests that it is important for ciliogenesis as well. And then finally, we think that NPHP5 plays an important role in protein trafficking in photoreceptors. And I just wanted to end my talk uh, that really the ultimate goal for this project, which it started for identification of NPHP5 as an important gene for retinal disease in humans, and then modeling the disease using in vitro and in, vitro, uh, in vivo and in vitro tools. The ultimate goal really is that we want to use these models um, as a platform for gene therapy and drug discovery uh, for, for this disease. And some of our ongoing studies that we have um, uh, uh, in this effect is that we already have an adeno-associated virus uh, that um, carries a wild-type copy of NPHP5, 
and is read, ready for basically some retinal injection in the NPHP5 knockout mouse to be able to show um, slow down retinal progression in our animal model. We have also have um, a new collaboration with the National Eye Institute um, to do a high throughput drug screening using uh, stem cell lines from, um, from our, our mouse and they have also identified a family in Chicago with NPHP5 mutations and to do high, uh, drug screening in the um, induced pluripotent stem cells from that family. And ultimately, we want to have those uh, drug targets to be validated in the mouse model itself. And then, as I've alluded earlier, we also have, uh, to go full circle, we have human genetic studies as well. We've identified three families in Utah uh, with senior locan syndrome, a very rare disease. We, uh, and we have um, uh, done, uh, at for the one family, we have finished, completed exome sequencing, and we have identified 10 new candidate genes. And so we may be able to find new genes and, um, and uh, repeat this process again for these very few patients. With that said, um, I thank uh, my mentor Wolfgang for allowing me to start this project and his mentorship, uh, the lab. We have many collaborators here at the Moran Eye Center um, and uh, I am open for any questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. So the in vitro assay that we first uh, will probably test first is uh, an RNAi knockdown. So this is I didn't show this, but these these are in kidney cell lines. So we think that the primary cilium is uh, uh, is a similar structure to the connecting cilium of photoreceptor cells. Um, so in here, the kidney cell lines uh, express NPHP5 and the no marker acetylated tubulin. When you knock down NPHP5, we see absence or significant decrease of NPHP5, down to 20%. Um, and so the goal is to be able to do high th drug, to rescue this effect, to be able to see uh, whether we can rescue the phenotypic um, uh, or the primary cell information again. So, and I think it's a pretty robust assay. Acetylated tubulin is good. Uh, the assay is straightforward, so I think we have a good readout. Yes, they can. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, thank you, Nico. Um, so there's a little bit of a switch from what's on the schedule just in the order. Um, next up, we're going to have Mike Taggart um, from here at the University of Utah speak about uh, using serum biomarkers. Thank you, thank you. Okay. 